Today I'm going to be looking at the mathematics that appears in the film The Man Who Knew Infinity. Let's get stuck into it. Now I'm hoping that if you've clicked on this video you have already seen the film The Man Who Knew Infinity but if not don't worry everything in this video is going to be self-contained. If you haven't seen the film please go watch it because it is honestly one of the best films there is out there for mathematics in my opinion. I think it portrays the elegance and the beauty of mathematics in a way that is, is just incredible. So yeah if you haven't seen it then definitely go check it out but we're going to be diving into some of the maths today. So the very opening scenes of the film that you see are these close-in shots of Ramanujan's manuscript, so his his work. In these pictures here, these are what you see in the film, and then these screenshots I've got here are actually from his actual book. So obviously what the filmmakers have tried to do is just show in the opening credits that yeah, these are the works of Ramanujan. And for me, I really like this opening scene where you get to see the, the maths that Ramanujan has done. And I think it's even more poignant as well because these are the books that essentially help get Ramanujan into Cambridge uh, and help propel him in his career as a mathematician. There is actually another example here. This alludes to Ramanujan's work on Q series. So just as a little taster, we can basically write a Q series as this. So it's the series where we have the sum k equals zero to infinity of one minus a q to the power k divided by one minus a q k plus n. The final part of this opening credit scene is this beautiful quote by Bertrand Russell and it says, mathematics rightly viewed possesses not only truth but supreme beauty. I thought this in itself was a beautiful quote that captured, in my opinion, the film and the life of Ramanujan. So now we've looked at the opening credits, what I'm going to be doing is showing you one of the first parts that we see of Ramanujan and it's about three minutes in. It's actually when Ramanujan is going to try and find a job and he says, look at all this maths that I've done. And the person he's speaking to basically says, you don't have a degree, so you're useless. And yet he has this book that probably holds more power in mathematics than any degree ever would. So we're going to analyse some of the things that we can see when he opens the book. So this part of the notebook here, so the left hand side, is looking at the work that Ramanujan did on magic squares. So I'll just put that there. Magic squares. And the idea behind the magic square is that if we had a 3x3 three three grid, so let's say 3x3 three three grid, this 3x3 three three grid basically is made up of nine different cells and each cell has a number one to nine in it. What you can do is you can add each of the columns, each of the rows and the diagonals and they will all come out to the same value. So I'll just write that down. Let's have a look at an example and this is actually Ramanujan's magic square. So I'm just going to underline this and say Ramanujan's magic square and his magic square had the numbers, what did we have? We had four, three, eight, nine, five, one, two, seven, and six. Now what you'll notice is if you were to sum this row, you'd get 15. If you did this row, you'd get 15. Likewise, this would be 15. And if you did the columns, they would all come out at the number 15 as well. And if you did the diagonal, these all come out at 15. And this is an example of a magic square. Now what Ramanujan has done, and this is what we can see in the book, is he extends his idea behind magic squares to a 3 by 4 grid. Uh, and that's what we see in the book. So here, this is a screenshot of the book, so it's just in this top corner here. This is the concept of the 3 by 4 rectangle. And I'm just going to write a little note here and say that Ramanujan turned his focus towards three by four. I'll call them rectangles. Now the first thing that we can do with this three by four grid, and it's essentially what Ramanujan did himself, is we look at the columns and we look at the rows and we can add them. Now if I just say here, adding each of the columns gives, if we do the columns we'll have a plus b plus I think that's 6d plus c, and this is going to equal let's say a number m. And then we'll do the same, C plus D plus B plus 4D plus, I think that's an A in there, plus D will equal M. So if you're a bit lost with what I'm doing, what I'm doing is just taking each of the columns. So we've taken this column, we've added it for here, 
and we've just done this one, so we're adding this column. And then we could do the same with the final two, which is quite simple, it's just A plus 2D plus B plus 2D plus C plus 2D again equals M, and then C plus 3D for the final column plus B plus A plus 3D equals M. Now, if you take each of these and simplify them, you basically get that these four equations all turn into the exact same equation. For the example is the top equation says A plus B plus 6D plus C equals M. If you simplify the second line, you get the exact same output because we have 1D here, we've got another 4Ds there, and another D there, so that gives you 6D plus the A, the B and the C, and the same happens again. So all that's happened here is we've been given this three by four rectangular grid and when you add each of the columns you get the exact same equation out which is great because that means that this equation satisfies the summation of each of the columns for this particular grid you might be looking at this picture and you might have noticed this formula here now this formula here actually comes from adding each of the rows so we get a plus c plus d plus a plus 2d plus C plus 3D must equal B plus 6D, I'm just checking I can read the writing correctly, plus I think that's a 4D in there, plus B plus 2D plus B, and we can say that that must also equal C plus, I think that's A plus D plus C plus 2D plus A plus 2, 3D, should I say. As an example for you to try at home, Equate these and see what you can reduce it down to, but essentially what you get is the A plus C equals, and I think that's 2B plus 3D. Now, what we see in the bottom of this picture, and it's just here, he illustrates this 3 by 4 example for different numbers, and he uses the numbers 8 and 15. So this one here... This is basically an example where we've constructed a 3x4 rectangular grid where the average of each of the elements equals the same number. Now Ramanujan focuses attention towards the average of the numbers in each of the grids and what we can find in this 3x4 rectangular grid on the left, these all give the average of the number 8. So if you were to look at the average of this column, you'd get 8 for all the columns, all the rows and even the diagonals. So this diagonal here would give you the number 8. And for the one on the right hand side, so this grid here, this was the average of the number 15. So this was kind of nice, it was a nice illustration of what Ramanujan had done in, in some of his earlier works and in his earlier books. There is actually something that's quite interesting and it's this grid here. And I was doing some research on Ramanujan's books because essentially there have been some mathematicians, they've written up Ramanujan's work. So there are papers that have gone into the analysis of Ramanujan's work. And in the paper that looks at this specific book, it's quite interesting, this grid here, they haven't actually managed to figure out what this corresponds to. This is unknown. It kind of remains unexplained. And interestingly, it's actually shown again in... A later scene and this is where Hardy, uh, the mathematician who Ramanujan works with at Cambridge, he tries to find Ramanujan and I noticed it, it's a little subtlety but when he looks through the window you can actually see, it's quite hard to tell but it's the same, it's the same sort of rectangle here. Yeah, nice little subtlety there. So that is Ramanujan's work on magic squares. I thought it was quite nice to mention in this video. We start out with something quite simple or at least easier to wrap your head around than maybe partitions, which I'll get onto in just a moment. But yeah, really nice. Now, the next part that I wanted to talk about was when we first hear about Hardy, Professor Hardy, and it's one of the characters that makes quite a simple comment on Hardy, and it's part where he says that he basically reformed the entire tripos at Cambridge. Now, what the character means by the tripos, that basically refers to the mathematical examinations that Cambridge math students had to take when they were studying there and because of the large influence of mathematicians such as Newton who was a very applied mathematician the focus in these examinations were towards more applied mathematics and Hardy didn't really like this he thought that the certain ways of 
teaching and, and examining students were not to his standards, should I say, and I'll be doing a deeper dive into this later, but he basically wanted to introduce more pure mathematics into the Tripos and he was successful. Now there are sections in the Cambridge degree of pure mathematics and applied mathematics and I was actually very fortunate enough to do part three of the mathematical Tripos at Cambridge a couple of years ago and it was incredible. Although I am an applied mathematician, I had seen some of the courses on pure mathematics and I'd seen some of the lecture notes and they were incredible. Now I wanted to mention that in the video today just because I thought the whole film itself focuses around pure mathematics and this was a nice little subtlety in the film. If you are watching this video and you have been intrigued by some pure mathematics or you want to learn a little bit more about the beauty of pure mathematics then you need to check out Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org have hundreds of courses covering a range of different STEM subjects including mathematics and they have courses on very specific pure mathematics and they are incredible. There are graph theory, number theory, logic, there's so many out there and I have had the pleasure of learning some new mathematics in these courses and they have honestly been incredible. The courses themselves cover a range of different abilities so anybody can sign up and get stuck in to some cool courses. Now as a side note what I thought was kind of cool about this film is that we learn about some of Ramanujan's famous theories and proofs in mathematics and what a lot of people don't know is these proofs have been so fundamental in understanding certain aspects in general day life and partitions that we'll get onto in just a moment massively help in computer systems. Now if you're interested in learning how to code, Brilliant also have beginner programming courses so if you want to learn how to code and you never have before then definitely check out Brilliant. Brilliant are kindly giving you watching this video full free access for 30 days. All you have to do is click on the link in the description box or in the pinned comment or head to brilliant.org forward slash Ellie Slytome and the first 200 of you that click on the link will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video, let's get back to the maths. So now we are moving on to the first letter that we see from Ramanujan and that is what he sends to Hardy and it's about 16 minutes into the film and this is a screenshot of it here and it's kind of hard to, to make out what certain things are and we don't need to worry too much about that because there is actually this down here which is the exact copy of the letter that Ramanujan wrote to Hardy and I just thought I'd include this in here just so you can kind of have a taste of some of the mathematics that was featured in the letter that Ramanujan sent to Hardy and as Littlewood, when Littlewood takes a look at the letter, he says that the paper includes integrals, infinite series and God knows what else. We have theorems on approximate integration and summation of series. It is quite powerful really, you know, you can pause the video and take a look yourself and just look at how he can take something as simple as this and say yes, this summation must just equal this. Now what's quite interesting and the reason why I wanted to include this in here is because a lot of Ramanujan's work were essentially just statements. It was him saying this summation here equals this value and what you notice in the film and when he comes to Cambridge is Hardy tries his hardest and they work together to provide proofs for these and Ramanujan to begin with doesn't understand the point of these proofs. He, he says that he has all of these ideas over the duration of the film. We see that they both work together as an incredible pair and they produce uh, an incredible proof, which I'll get onto in just a moment. But I thought I'd just include that here because a lot of the work that Ramanujan first posed came without proofs. And yeah, it sets a precedence for the remainder of the film. So the next part that I wanted to talk about comes about 34 minutes in and it's when there is a professor giving a lecture and when Ramanujan first comes to Cambridge, what all of the other professors decide is that he should take classes along with the other students. Now he comes into this class and without giving too much of a spoiler, he basically finishes off the proof for the professor. But basically what was first illustrated on the blackboard are elliptic integrals. So we're gonna go back to writing and I'm just gonna say this is an elliptic integral. So the pure definition of an elliptic integral is we have some function of we'll say phi and k and all it has is the definition of an integral between phi and zero of one over the square root of one minus k squared sine squared theta and then of course we have a d phi. Now this is the definition of an elliptic integral. Now what we can do to reduce it into the form that we can see on the blackboard is all we do is we substitute t equals sine theta 
and x equals sine phi. Now, when you do that, what happens is this integral reduces to the function that depends on x and k, which equals from x, 0 to x, dt, and it's 1 over, and it's 1 minus t squared, 1 minus k squared t squared, and then the square root of that. So this is what it reduces to. Now you might notice, if we zoom in very, very closely, that is what we have here. So we have dt here, all over. The integral is here, we've got the zero, we've got the square root. This here is a, a t squared, it's not a very nice looking t. Again here we have a t squared here. We've got the brackets, and we've got the one minus, the one minus k squared. Uh, and yeah, that is what we see on the board. And again, this here is actually what we had to begin with. It's this form here. Now you might actually look, and it's not really very clear in the screenshot I've got here of the film. You can sort of see it in the film itself, is the integral limit here is actually pi over two. If we remember from here, we have phi as the top limit, but in the board itself, it says that phi is pi over two. So I'm just gonna say that when phi is pi over two, the integral, it's, it's said to be what is known as complete. So the integral is, is said to be complete. So that is basically what is seen on the blackboard. Okay, awesome. So now you might be wondering, well, okay, so we, we know what's on the blackboard, cool. But what has Ramanujan actually done? Like, what, what did he write? Because for me, when I first watched this, I kind of looked at the, the equation on the board. And at the time, the first time I watched this was, I think it was before, it was definitely before university. I think I was maybe 16 when I watched this. And I remember looking at the two differences and I genuinely just thought that Ramanujan had written some random series uh, equation on the board and it was irrelevant to what he'd written. And obviously then when the professor says, I hadn't finished that proof yet, it kind of makes sense that this is the output. This is equivalent to uh, the same thing. But we're going to look at what Ramanujan wrote and how it corresponds to what was written on the board originally. So we have elliptic integrals. Now, what you can actually do is you can represent this elliptic integral as a power series. And that is exactly what Ramanujan wrote on the board itself. So let me just say we can represent this as a power series. Now the power series itself says that K, now K is given, I should have mentioned this actually, when we have that phi is pi over two, the integral is said to be complete. When it's said to be complete, we can rewrite this with some notation. So I'll just say we have K, and where K is a function of K, and this equals the complete version of the elliptic integral. So I'll just add this in here just for people that are wondering because I realise I, I just noted here we have k and you might have got that confused with this k that appears in the function itself, but k is a function itself. So we have k squared, sine squared, uh, and again this is between 1 and 0 when we add the substitution values in. Okay, so Ramanujan says k of k equals pi over 2, 1 plus a half squared k squared, plus 1 times 3, 2 times 4, k to the 4, plus plus plus, and it actually ends in 2n minus 1 factorial 2n factorial squared k to the 2n all together. So this is what this elliptic integral can be written as, as a power series, and you guessed it, that's exactly what Ramanujan wrote when he wrote on the board. It's kind of quite hard to see here, but we have the exact same form of it here. Now, what he hasn't added is the kind of n term. So he just assumes that we have k to the 6 plus some numbers, but it can actually be proven that this is the formula for the nth term of this power series. 
So yeah, very, very nice. And I've tried to get both the screenshots here where you can sort of see what's been written. Um, it's a little bit easier when you see the film itself because you can add pause and, and see where it where it crops up. But yeah, I, I wanted to talk about this because I thought it was really, really cool and something a little bit different Yeah, in the film. So that is Elliptic Integrals and that is what is featured on the blackboard during the scene with the professor who gets rather angry at Ramanujan. Okay, now at 42 minutes into the film, this is where some more excitement happens and it's when Ramanujan comes to Hardy with a new proof. And the proof itself is on what are known as partitions. And he basically says that partitions themselves can approximate to this over large values. So firstly, what are partitions? So in mathematics, partitions are basically a way of writing a number as a summation of positive integers. So let's take, for example, the number four. So how many ways can we write the number four in terms of different integers, positive integers? So we can say, well, four equals four. We can write it as the number four. We can also write it as the number three plus one. We can also say it's two plus two. It's also two plus one plus one. And it's also one plus one plus one plus one. So there are one, two, three, four, five, five different ways we can write the number four in partitions. So it's five ways to partition the number four. So that's an introduction into what partitions are. Before we dive into some other numbers, I'm going to introduce some notation. And all that is, is basically saying, okay, P for partition. So let's say we want to partition the number four. How many ways are there to do that? And the answer is five, because we've just shown there are five ways to partition it. But what about as the numbers get bigger? So let's say, for example, what about P partition of five is seven? Okay, cool. What about number six? There are, there are 11 ways to partition the number six. Now, okay, let's let's skip a few numbers. What about P to the P of nine? P of nine is 30. So you might think, well, there's not really kind of a massive increase in between each of these values, but let's look at P of 100, for example. And P of 100 is actually 190 million. 569,292. That's how many ways there are to partition the number 100. The larger value you have to partition, this number is just gonna grow incredibly fast. Now, what's kind of funny about this is because they had no formula for partitions, these had to be done by hand. And you can see that in the film, there's a part where when Ramanujan comes up with his idea behind what the formula for a partition is, there's another professor who actually counts, I think it's 200, the number 200, uh, and they both compare uh, and yeah, get within pretty much a very accurate range of the partition of the number 200. I think that's the number in the film. So yeah, it's, it's quite crazy how when you increase the number, the ways of partitioning it just get exponentially large. So we've looked at partitions. Now I wanna show you a little bit of the mathematics behind it. Now there is what is known as a generating function for the partitions and the generating function can be given as this. So generating function and it's given as from k equals one to infinity of one over minus x k. This equals the summation from n equals zero to infinity of p n x n, where p n is partitions. So this is partitions here. Now you might be looking at this and thinking, how on earth are those two equivalent? And that's what I'm going to be showing you today, because it's kind of cool. I quite like the maths behind it. So let's first start by saying, well, if we have the product from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 1 minus xk, well, we can write this as, okay, well, 1. Let's, let's start with k equals 1. So we have 1 over 1 minus x multiplied by 1 over 1 minus x squared. So that's for k equals 2 over one minus x cubed multiplied and so on. Now we can look at this and if we treat each of these kind of individually, you might recognize where these have 
can be seen in, in other areas of mathematics and it's in the geometric series. So a geometric series basically says we have a series of a plus a r plus a r squared plus a r cubed. We can say that this actually equals a over 1 minus r. Now this formula here looks very similar to the formulas that we see here that are multiplied by each other and they basically are. So what we can say is that, okay, let's take, I'll note this number one, this number two, this number three. So number one, we can write number one. So number one is one over one minus x. So this must correspond to a series of one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on by the definition of geometric series and I'll just say this is geometric series okay now let's do number two so number two is one over one minus x squared so this must be the geometric series of one plus x squared plus x to the four and so on and likewise we can do the same with number three and number three is 1 over 1 minus x cubed, I believe, yep. So we get 1 plus x cubed plus x to the 6, and so on. So we can rewrite this here in terms of each of these. So let's do that. So let's start by saying this, which is what we had before, this is actually equal to 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and so on, multiplied by 1 plus x squared plus x to the 4, and so on, multiplied by 1 plus x cubed plus x to the 6, and so on, and multiplied by even more terms here. Now, what you might notice is if we were to take this, now this, this takes a little bit of staring at this for a little bit of time. What actually happens is when you multiply each of these brackets together, what you are doing is you are essentially creating the partitions for each of the coefficients. So what we find is when you multiply these brackets together, what we find is we have one because we have, we'll have one multiplied by one, multiplied by one, multiplied by all the other ones. So we only have one, one. Now let's look at the x's. So let's have a look. So we'll have x multiplied by one, multiplied by one, multiplied by all the other ones. And there's no other way of making an x because all of the other terms after this one here don't have x in them. So we just have one x. So one plus x plus, okay, let's look at x squared now. So we have x squared here and this will be multiplied by all the ones and so on, okay? And then we also have an x squared appearing in the second bracket here. So we'll have an x squared multiplied by the ones, multiplied by all the other ones, so we end up with two x squared. Now we can do the same for x cubed, and note we have it appear here, so that will be multiplied by all the other ones. Then we also have x squared in here, multiplied by x, multiplied by all the other ones, that's an other, another way of doing it, but there's also an x cubed here, and that will be multiplied by all the other ones. So there, there are three ways of getting x cubed. And then if you do the same for all the other terms, you can do the same for x to the 4, and we end up with 5x to the 4, and so on. And what you might have noticed is each of the coefficients out front actually correspond to the number of partitions. So we can rewrite this as the summation of partition of n for x to the power n between n equals zero and infinity. And yeah, that's how we are able to deduce this generating function here. So just a little bit of manipulation, but some really nice manipulation. And yeah, that's how we get the generating function. Now, obviously what happens in the film Basically, Hardy, so I'll just write Hardy and Ramanujan prove that P of n, so the partition of n, approximates to 1 over 4n, square root of 3, exponential of pi 
square root of 2n over 3, which honestly is is incredible. And the the proof to this, and I just need to mention that's for n as n tends towards infinity. Now, the proof for this is ridiculous, but if you want me to give it a go, I'll be making a separate video on it. So just let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to depict some of the mathematics behind Ramanujan's proof. Yeah, there's a lot to it. It's quite a ridiculous proof, a beautiful proof, but a lot to it. So let me know in the comments if you want to see it. This is what we see, one of the final parts of the film, and it's when Hardy is arguing his case for Ramanujan to become a fellow. And we can see just here, the definition, yeah, which is which is crazy. Now, I wanted to finish the video off on just kind of the ending scenes of the film, and it's these two here, and it basically just says that in 1976, a lost notebook was discovered containing groundbreaking new formulas from the last years of Ramanujan's life, and it says the importance of which was compared to the discovery of Beethoven's 10th symphony, which in itself is, yeah, it speaks volume. And then it goes on to say, a century later, these formulas are being used to understand the behavior of black holes. Now, I also added this section in here. The majority of the formulas within the final notebook are about Q series and Mach theta functions, and about a third are about modular equations and singular moduli, and the remaining formulas are mainly about integrals. We love integrals. Dirichlet series, apologies if I pronounced that incorrectly, congruences and asymptotics. And the mock theta functions in the notebook have been found to be useful for calculating the entropy of black holes. So I just included this last part here just so you understood which parts of the notebook um, were being used to understand uh, the behaviour of black holes. But I just wanted to finish on that note. There is a whole other notebook of, of Ramanujan's that was groundbreaking and yeah, absolutely incredible. I have been so excited to share this video and to do this video because I've spent so long looking at the film and analysing parts of it. It's, it's honestly taken me so long as this video. So I really hope I've done it justice. If you did enjoy the video, please let me know in the comments and let me know any other videos you'd like to see. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.